Now, last week, I had to trim a branch on a tree. I climbed up the ladder. It was probably no more than 20 feet. And I was clinging to the ladder like a monkey to its mother. You know, those monkeys. I thought, why am I such a chicken? What happened to my fearlessness? Welcome to Church of the Rock from Winnipeg. Stay tuned to this week's thought-provoking message from Pastor Mark Hughes. Well, this morning I'm starting a brand new mini-series called Fear Factor. How many of you remember where that name comes from? You remember the early 2000s? You remember the show? Starring Joe Rogan. We all know who Joe Rogan is, the Joe Rogan experience. He's more famous for his podcast than Fear Factor. But back in the 2000s, kind of 2000 to 2006, he hosted the show Fear Factor. It was mostly young people that went on the show, and there was good reason for it. Because what they did was they tempted people and put them in fearful situations where they had to, you know, jump off, you know, bridges and uh, bungee jump and put them in these perilous situations. But an episode never went by where they didn't involve eating something really gross. So we're going to be in this series on fear. We're going to be looking at the fear factor, and we're going to be looking at a whole bunch of different things about fear. Normally, fear is considered a very negative thing. We probably all know that, right? Uh, you look into scripture. Uh, when the champions of faith exhibited their faith, what they did was they overcame their fears. David overcame the fear of Goliath. Uh, we have Jehu overcame the fear of Jezebel. We had Job who overcame the fear of his wife. A and Satan, he, he was scary too. And, uh, and we look into the New Testament when Jesus rebuked his disciples for having no faith. Do you remember what he said to them? He said, why are you so fearful? And we all know what fear does to us. It paralyzes us. It immobilizes us. And that's what's so negative about fear. And we have, we have names for them. We call them phobias in today's culture, don't we? And there's lots of them. There's acrophobia, which is the fear of heights. And there's arachnophobia, which is the fear of spiders. And there, my, my personal favorite, it's xylophata quiopiophobia. You know what that is? The fear of mispronouncing words. <laughs> is, is that appropriate or what? Some of you are wondering whether I pronounce that word right or not. You'll never know, will you? You'll never be able to figure that out. And so when we look at these, a lot of negative fears, we're going to look at that. But I thought, let's talk about the upside of fear, because there is an upside to fear. Like, for example, if you can't swim, a little fear of water wouldn't be a bad thing, would it? If you aren't, let's say, a lion tamer, a little fear of wild, deadly beasts might not be a bad thing. If you don't know how to fly, a little fear of extreme heights might not be a bad thing. Now, when I grew up, I was one of these absolute fearless people slash stupid in that I was not afraid of heights at all whatsoever. I used to climb those transmission towers. I'd go over the fence and climb them two, three hundred feet in the air. I would go, we had a, tele, uh, a lamp stand, a, a light, street light in front of our house. I used to climb up that street light, shimmy to the end, and hang from one hand above the cars like this. My mother was really annoyed by that, by the way. Now, last week, I had to trim a branch on a tree. I climbed up the ladder. It was probably no more than 20 feet. And I was clinging to the ladder like a monkey to its mother. You know, those monkeys. I thought, why am I such a chicken? What happened to my fearlessness? I don't know. Maybe it's age. Maybe it's maturity. Maybe it's wisdom. Who knows? But what we're going to do today is we're going to look at one of the upsides, the most important upside of fear. And I'll tell you what it is. It's simply this. It's the fear of the Lord. And Oswald Chambers, most of you probably know who he is, right? He wrote My Utmost for the Highest. Probably, here's a picture of probably the greatest devotional book you will ever read in your life. And uh, he has these fantastic quotes. One of his quotes was this, whereas the remarkable thing about God is when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. And that is a profound statement. Because when we fear God, I'm telling you, there's nothing in this world you fear. And so we want to look at that, this whole idea of the fear of the Lord. My verse today is Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. Listen to this. It says, the fear 
of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For by me your days will be multiplied, and your sorry, and years of your life will be added to you. You know, when I look at our world today, I see an epidemic of fear and anxiety. We know that they tell us now that 50% of people suffer from some form of anxiety or fear. Is that how you want to live your life? It says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And by it, long life. And your years multiplied. I mean, that sounds pretty good to me. But I want to begin by dispelling something because I bet every single one of you in this room has heard a sermon on the fear of the Lord and somebody, some well-meaning, good-intentioned preacher told you this. They said, when this word there says fear of the Lord, it's not talking about fear. It's the word, it should be translated reverence or awe. Well, I got news for you. That is true. We should have awe of God. We should revere God, no question about that. But I got news for you. That word, the fear of the Lord, that word fear, you know what it means? Fear. That's what it means. It's the same word that was used when the Israel came up against Goliath. Goliath, and it says the men of Israel were dreadfully afraid and they fled. It's the same word. You say, why would God want us to fear him so that we would remember who he is and who we are? The intent of it is for us to remind that he is a fearsome and an awesome God and that we are nowhere near on the same level. Go look into scripture. You find out what happened when people encountered the Lord. And what they did was it, one after another. You read the stories, David and Solomon and, and Aaron and Moses and Joshua. When they encountered the Lord, it says they fell down on their faces in fear of him. We look at the story of Isaiah, and he saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. When he actually encountered God for who he was, it says, he says, Woe is me, for I am a man undone. He was completely undone in the presence of God. So when it talks about the fear of the Lord, don't diminish it. Don't dumb it down to be, mean something, you know, God, that we just, you know, we respect him and we, we revere him. And those things are true. But he actually wants to put in us a sense of terror. You say, I don't understand why. Well, that's why you come to church, to figure these things out, right? So I want to tell you a little story. It'll, I think it'll really help illustrate this. So when I went into junior high, we had this principal of the school that nobody had ever talked to. He stood in the halls, and we were all terrified of him because we'd all heard stories. We heard that this man was a terror. We heard that he had, don't, don't miss the junior high mindset here. We heard that he had a torture chamber in the back room of his office. And he had all kinds of instruments to torture. We heard stories of kids who were beaten half to death. We heard stories of some kids that went down to the principal's office and never returned. And I mean, you know, this is the little mind at work, you know, in grade seven and grade eight. And so we would see him in the halls, and he never spoke to us, and you did not make eye contact with him, because that itself could be deadly. And so we feared this guy. His name was Mr. Yates. We had a slogan behind his back. It went like this, who hates Yates? I do. And <laughs> we, we all hated Yates. None of us ever, ever had encountered him. So we had this incident one day. I had my best friend in junior high was a guy named Mike. And uh, Mike had a bad encounter in French class one day where Monsieur de Montier had uh, humiliated him in front of the class because he you know, conjugated a verb incorrectly. And he was so mad at Monsieur de Montier that he said this. He said, I'm going to get back at him. And he had decided that what he was going to do was over the weekend he was going to go and egg the French cl classroom windows. And he recruited me to help. I said, we can't do that. If we're caught, we'll be killed. We, th th a crime like that will be punishable by death. He says, how are we going to get caught? We'll do it Friday night after dark, and no one will ever know but you and me. So I thought, well, you can't go wrong with that logic now, can you? <laughs> and, so, and, so, and so we went down to Safeway. We bought a dozen eggs. I, I got to admit to you, it was super fun. Like, I loved egg in the school. Uh, I don't know if that reveals too much about me. But anyway, we went down Friday night. It was after dark. He did six. I did six. There was 12 windows. We just plastered those windows. <laughs> it was so much fun. And we were, woo, high-fiving each other. Wow, what a coup. For the rest of the weekend, Mike told every single person we encountered. But here's the good news. 
He swore them to secrecy. That's always a safe bet with a teenager, right? You just swear them to secrecy. So on Monday morning, we're sitting in the French class. All 12 windows are plastered with dried egg. The teacher turns to the class and said, in English, all right, who egged my windows? <laughs> the whole class turned to Mike and me. Every single person knew. So we got sent down to the principal's office. We had to go to Mr. Yates. I didn't have a cell phone. We didn't have cell phones during those days. I couldn't even phone my mother to say goodbye for the last time. <laughs> and so when we got down, we were both shaking like a leaf. I mean, we had such fear of this man. We were shaking like a leaf. And there he was sitting at his desk with the strap in his hand. And then he pulled out two buckets and two sponges. And I thought, there will be so much bloodshed, they will need <laughs> buckets and sponges to clean it up. And then he handed us the buckets and sponges and said, go clean off those windows. <laughs> and off we went, we cleaned the windows, and that was the end of it. And I thought, we were so fearful of this man. And all we had to do was make right of our crime and our transgression. And the scriptures tells us this in Romans chapter 11. It says, do not forget the goodness and the severity of the Lord. Severity to those who fell and goodness towards you. You see, we need to understand this about God. God actually, his intent is for us to actually fear the fact that he is the awesome creator of the heaven and the earth. And that he actually can snuff you out in a moment. But he really wants to forgive you. But he's not going to let us just go through life letting God be our buddy. Right? Here's the problem. When I look around people today, God's their buddy. God's their homeboy. God's their heavenly butler. You know, God's their, you know, their bubba. And you know, that's not, that's not who God is. That is no reflection of who the God of the universe, the creator of heaven and earth is. And I want to show you another verse here. And this other verse is so powerful. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's Luke chapter 12, because I, I'm going to ask you a question. If I was to look at the world, or maybe this is more of a statement, if I was to look at the world, and I was, you're saying, Pastor Mark, what is the one problem? If you had to pick one problem in the world, what would it be? Would it be sin? Would it be injustice? Would it be hatred? Would it be violence? Would it be war? Would it be climate change? What, what would it be? And if I had to pick one thing, that one thing would be a lack of the fear of the Lord. We live in a t day and a time and an age and a culture where people do not fear God. And look at what it says here in Luke chapter 12. These are the words of Jesus. You know how you know that? It's in red. And, and that's how you know. And Luke chapter 12, verse 4, it says, And I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. And after that have no more that they can do. Isn't that, isn't that good to know? That once they, they've killed you, Nothing more they can do, worse than that. That's pretty good. Uh, but I show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has the power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. This is Jesus telling us to fear the Lord. Are you following this? He's saying, you know what? Why are you fearful of things in this world? All they can do is kill you. What's the worst that happens? You go to heaven. Is that so bad? Well, that is sort of bad. You're a wimp. Seriously, it, there's, there's nothing really they can do. He says, don't fear those who can kill your life or steal your goods or destroy your property. Don't, don't fear them. Fear the one who can cast you into hell. This sense of eternal damnation should terrify us. And there was a time in the Middle Ages, and there was a time in the past, and there was a time in the beginning of Scripture where people actually were afraid of that. People are not afraid of those things anymore. So here's what we're going to do. And we're going to take a couple of moments, and we're going to look at what the point of the fear of the Lord is. And it really makes sense. The first thing he said was this, was the fear of the Lord was the beginning of wisdom. But there's three things I want to talk about. I'm going to throw them up on the screen. Here they are. Uh, the fear of the Lord produces three things in you. Number one, the wisdom. Number two, the witness. And number three, the wonder. And he begins by saying the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, there's a big difference between wisdom and knowledge. Knowledge actually is so far below wisdom. You can get knowledge anyway. You know what knowledge is? This is really deep. 
you might want to write this down. Knowledge is knowing stuff. That's, that's what knowledge is. And you can get knowledge anywhere. You can go uh, and go on Wikipedia and you can get knowledge. You can read a book and you can get knowledge. You can watch Jeopardy and you can get knowledge. Wisdom is something way different. Wisdom is actually knowing what you ought to do. That's what wisdom is, with what you know. And the thing that impressed God so much about Solomon, remember he was given this, this offer. He said, ask what you will. I'll give you anything you want, and, and I'll give it to you. And he asked for wisdom to lead his people. And God was so impressed with him that he gave him this incredible wisdom. And he gave him riches and honor and long life, and he gave him all those things in addition to it. But he was so impressed that the one thing that Solomon wanted more than anything else was this thing called wisdom. And the very first instance in scripture, it's quite comical actually, was the first test of this wisdom was these, there was these two women, you'll remember this story, and they both had new infant babies almost around the same time. One rolled over on, on her baby during the night and suffocated it, and so she switched with the other woman, switched the baby. Now, in the morning, the mother with the baby taken was in, enraged and said, that's my baby, and the two were fighting over the live baby, and they brought this case before Solomon. Now, there's one baby, two women. They're both claiming to be the owner. He had no way of knowing. He had no knowledge of whose baby was whom, right? But he had wisdom. <laughs> so he came up with a great idea. He said, well, we'll just cut the baby in half, give you each half, problem solved, right? <laughs> Can you believe he did this? Can you believe the king suggested we'll cut the baby in half? Anyway, it worked, didn't it? Because the mother who actually was the true mother, said, no, she can have it. She can have it. And Solomon immediately knew, because he was a man of wisdom, immediately knew that the true mother would always spare the life of her child. And so she got the baby. And so that's an, this, this incredible example about wisdom. And see, wisdom isn't knowing everything. Wisdom comes, the scripture says, comes from above. And the scripture specifically tells us this, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And there's something about when we fear God, when we decide that we're going to position ourselves in life in such a way that we are going to be in awe and reverence and fear of God that produces a level of wisdom in our lives. And what we do, see, here's what happens. When you fear God, you want to do the right thing. You following this? It's this simple. When I'm fearing God, I'm not okay with lying. I'm not okay with cheating. I'm not okay with doing all these things because I fear God too much. And because I fear God, I'm going to do the right thing. And that's the beginning of wisdom. It's so, 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 so simple. And I used to tell my kids this. See, when we send our kids off to school, you never know what they're going to encounter in a given day, right? You think, how, how are they going to know what to do? How are they going to handle whatever eventuality might happen during a day at school or at practice or wherever they are? And you can't possibly foresee that and tell them, here's how you handle this and here's how you handle that. And so instead, I just used to always tell my kids this. I say, decide in the morning when you leave the house that whatever situation you're in, you're going to do the right thing. And if you decide you're going to always do the right thing every time, you've actually made a thousand decisions in advance. And it's really not that complicated. And that's what the fear of the Lord does. We don't, we don't know everything. We don't have all knowledge. But we have wisdom that is found and rooted in the fear of God. Because whatever I am faced with, I'm going to ask myself, what would God want me to do in this so I don't displease him? And you'll be amazed at how easy it is to answer that. See, if you're, if you're a man and you're contemplating doing this, leaving your wife, abandoning your children, and running off with your secretary, that might seem like a really fantastic idea. <laughs> I mean, people do it all the time. And you always think, what were they thinking? The answer, nothing. Nothing. That's the problem. They're not thinking about this. But when you add a little fear of the Lord to that, what happens is you go, I can't do that. I fear God too much to make a stupid decision like that and hurt all of those people, and it would disappoint God. And because of my fear of God, I'm going to make the right decision. I know that was like a weird example, but it's actually that simple how this works. So the first thing is, is the wisdom that comes. The second thing, and I'm just going to race through these last two real quick, uh, the, the second thing is the witness. And I want to I show you something. You see, when we fear God, we are a far better witness to the world, that's what I'm talking about, than when we don't. And I want to show you this little verse. 
And it's uh, Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13. And it says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance, and the evil way. He says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance, and the evil way. To hate those things. Now, here's where we've misinterpreted that. We think that that means that if we fear God, we're just supposed to call out and hate the evil and the arrogance and the pride in our world. That is not what it's talking about. Whose pride, arrogance, and evil way do you think he's talking about? Yours. It's talking about you. The, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil in your own life. Remember, even Jesus talked about that. He said, before you take the speck out of your brother's eye, take the what? The log out of your own eye out. See, the, the evil we're supposed to hate, the arrogance we're supposed to hate, is the arrogance that we have in ourselves and the evil in ourselves and the, and the wickedness within ourselves. And those are the things that we're supposed to deal with. And what happens is this, is that our witness is just so much better when we fear the Lord because, like I said, we're making those good decisions that come out of wisdom and our witness to the world is so much better. People, don't think for a moment people aren't watching you. As a Christian, they are watching you. I remember my pastor growing up used to say this, if you want to know how a Christian should live, just ask an unbeliever. They'll always tell you how you ought to live. They're watching you. You are an epistle known and read by all men, the scripture says. And so we have this great responsibility. And through my 40 years of ministry, I am shocked at how many pastors, well-known, celebrity Big name pastors that have fallen. People like, some of you will remember these names, Jimmy Baker and Jimmy Swaggart and Ted, Ted Haggard and other people within other circles like Carl Lentz and more recently Ravi Zacharias, terrible story with that and that. Bill Hybels, one of my great heroes uh, in, in the church for knowing how to build a church, Willow Creek in Chicago, six months before he retired, this revelation of the kind of life he was living came out. And every time we do that, every single time that happens in our life or in a pastor's life, in a Christian's life, what does it do? It brings reproach unto the gospel. It ruins and diminishes our witness to the world. And that's why he says the fear of the Lord is to hate evil and arrogance and pride in your own life. And <laughs> this is going to sound really weird, but I'm going to say it anyway. I was so glad when Billy Graham died. He said, What? I was so glad that he died before he ever messed up. He's one of the few guys, he lived to 99 years old without a single scandal of his own making. I thought, good, good enough, finally we got somebody that made it. And he lived to 99 just to prove that it can be done. You don't have to fall and into miserable sin, people. We can actually make it. And I remember, and I'll never forget this, in 1993 I was watching an interview he did with David Frost of the BBC, and it's actually, there's a little picture of these two, and as he was asking a bunch of really deep and probing questions, David Frost was, and this was the one question he asked them. He said, are you looking forward, because he was already <laughs> old in 93, he says, are you looking forward to going to heaven and on to your reward? And Billy Graham said, frankly, I'm a little bit worried because I feel like sometimes that maybe I wasn't as faithful to what God had asked me to do as I should have been. And I remember being floored by that and thinking, if Billy Graham is worried about going to heaven, what hope is there for the rest of us? <laughs> that's, that's exactly what I was thinking. Now, of course, of course, you know, we don't have to be perfect, right? We don't absolutely have to be perfect. But it's so nice to see the success stories of people who have finished well. All right, so the first thing is this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord has everything to do with our witness. And the last and the final thing is this. The fear of the Lord produces a wonder in us. And the wonder is so important. Now, this is sort of going to start bad, this story, but I can't help that. We, we had the church in the book of Acts. By Acts chapter 5, they had lost their fear of the Lord. And this is often what happens. You find these stories where people crash and burn in Scripture. More often than not, invariably, what happened is was they lost their fear of the Lord. And they started to do bad things once they lost the fear of the Lord. So you have these two people, Ananias and, Ananias and Sapphira. And everybody was selling their property, and they were giving it to the church, and they were building this big church. And, and no one was required to do that, but they were doing it out of their own free will and volition. And Ananias and Sapphira, they came and gave their money, and they lied. 
And they said it was all the proceeds, but they actually was, weren't being honest and they had kept some back, which was their, their right to do that. But they lied and said that they had given and all of it. And, and Peter says, what has inspired you or provoked you to lie to the Holy Spirit? And first of all, Ananias, he, he drops dead. And three hours later, his wife Sapphira comes in and, and uh, she tells the same story, not knowing what happened to her husband. And, and, and she drops dead. And, you know, it doesn't say that God killed him. <laughs> I suppose it was a coincidence. Doubt it. <laughs> Doubt it. But here's where it goes. And I don't want you to miss this. It says, then great fear came upon the church and great signs and wonders were done at the hands of the apostles. You see, what happened when was the fear of the Lord, irrespective of that terrible story I just told you, when the fear of the Lord came back and when it came back into people's hearts, that's when you begin to see the wonder and the great things that God can and does do. So let me just close with one final story here. Probably all, all you remember this story. Uh, it was January 15th, 2009. Uh, flight uh, 1549 has taken off out of LaGuardia Airport in New York. And it encounters, here's a picture of the flight, and it sucked up a bird into one of its engines. The plane only has two engines, by the way. And uh, a few minute, moments later, it sucked up another bird in its other engine. Now, you remember it was Captain Sullenberg, former fighter pilot. He had no time to get this plane back to the airport. He had only had one thing he could do, and that was to ditch the plane in the Hudson River. Now, remember, it's January 15th. New York City is cold in the winter. The waters are absolutely frigid. He brings this giant airliner with incredible skill uh, down onto the Hudson River. Everybody's on their cell phone. They're all within cell range, and they're all phoning their family to say goodbye. And this is their last moment. And we have a guy by the name of Michael Whitesides, and he's sitting in, in seat, seat 10B. He's in the, the exit row, and he's sitting there, and he's thinking some of the same things. And he remembered two days before, he had been reading Genesis chapter 22. And when Abraham had, was willing to sacrifice his son, it says he did so because of the fear of the Lord. He was willing to do this extraordinary thing. And he, he remembered two days earlier saying this. He said, that's the kind of Christian I want to be. That no matter what situation I am in, I'm going to fear nothing but the Lord. And all of a sudden, he's fearing nothing but death. <laughs> and he's reminded of this. And he says to the Lord, Lord, I'm ready. And the Lord spoke to him and said, ready for what? I'm not done with you yet. And he says, he thought he was ready to die. He said, I'm not done with you yet. And so the plane lands on the water, it's not sinking yet because, you know, it's got air in the fuselage. He knows what he needs to do. He opens the, the, the hatch, throws it into the water. Some lady, struck by fear, runs to the exit and jumps out into the frigid water of the Hudson River. That's not what people were doing. There was those, you know, inflatables that come out. And, and you remember the story that ended up on the wings. So in that moment, he had to decide what to do. Whether he was going to save his own life, fear for his own life, and the fear of the Lord was upon me. He knew he had to do the right thing. He dove in after her. And he saved this woman. And he dragged her back up onto the wing. And here's the picture. All 155 of those passengers lived, including this woman that <laughs> jumped into the Hudson River. And this man had dragged her out and, and saved her life. And people said, you can never prepare for a moment like that. And he said, yes, you can. When you fear the Lord, you were always ready for anything that God has in mind for your life. You see, the fear of the Lord is a powerful and an awesome thing. It'll cause us to live in such a way that we will begin to stir up a new wisdom, be a better witness to the world, and ultimately we will see the great and awesome wonders of God. That's the power of the fear of the Lord. If you'd like a booklet to help you understand more about God's gift of forgiveness and reconciliation through Jesus Christ, please contact us and we'd be happy to send you a free copy of the Book of Hope. Visit our website at www.churchoftherock.ca. Thank you for watching and God bless you.